Good morning. Welcome to St. John this morning. It is the sixth Sunday after Trinity, and today we especially will be considering um, the purpose and really of what, what God's law is for us, uh, which means that uh, well, God's law, it, it does accuse us and it directs, directs us towards our sins. So maybe not the most upbeat of themes, right? Um, but that is all for the purpose then of driving us to faith in Christ where we have forgiveness. Oh yeah, it's on. And now it's back on. It's not on back there, so that's the question. Yeah, look at the mixer there on the wall. The amp's on. You guys will figure it out. Okay, very good. Uh, Let's begin then with our hymn of invocation, All Who Believe and Are Baptized, hymn 601. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our, our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them for heaven. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me. Lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. 
hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. To God, one high name. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness, and of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the sixth Sunday after Trinity is from Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, 
rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the heart. The epistles from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. 
I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty,
For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul stood in the midst of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens at the Areopagus. So we heard this week in our congregation of prayer. These men, these philosophers, were the intellectuals of the day, whose reason and logic could run circles around what we call critical thinking today. And Paul was sent to them by our Lord Jesus with a message, a message that Paul calls, according to the philosopher, foolishness and a stumbling block. So it is that if Paul plays their game on their turf, it's not going to go well. What these men, the most brilliant intellects of their day, know cannot be refuted by their means, by their methodology. They've arrived at their conclusions, they hold to them steadfastly, and they'll debate endlessly with you about whose philosophy, that is, love of wisdom, is the most truthful, the most beneficial for daily life. These philosophers, Stoics and Epicureans, amongst others, are still arguing about who is right even today. So Paul doesn't play their game. He begins his sermon with a truth bomb. He says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He gets it right. These men are brilliant, but their philosophy makes them very religious. They are reverent. They're devoted. They're absolutely committed to really what is their faith tradition. They do what they believe their gods want from them. Whether their gods are themselves, in the case of the Epicureans, or their god is the divine Logos, that of the Stoics. These philosophers, like all people, have a code, an ethic, a moral framework, and they're absolutely committed to it, and they'll fiercely defend it, even religiously. But as we heard this week, seeing an altar with an inscription to the unknown God, Paul perceives an opportunity. Rather than address the world and their life and all things in the ways that they do, that is, according to what they can feel and touch and taste and smell and sense, what they can suss out according to their reason, Paul confesses the unknown God, and he tells them exactly who it is, the Creator Father, the Savior Son, and the Life-Giver Spirit. Paul speaks not of the gods who they have found in their own nature, or the gods that they have fashioned with their hands after their desires of their own heart, or after themselves. Paul speaks of the eternal, knowable God who reveals himself throughout history in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The one they call the unknown God has made himself known in Jesus. So, God the Holy Trinity is not distant, but is and has always been intimately near, despite their stubborn refusal and the refusal of all mankind to acknowledge him. At the most, these Athenian philosophers will just give a nod and a wink to this god of the gaps, calling him the unknown god. But actually, that's how all mankind from Adam have preferred their gods or god to be. Somewhat distant, abstract, really not knowable. If you can keep God at arm's length from you, well, then he really won't be all that demanding. He won't be too difficult for you. He won't offend you. So on the one hand, if you can do this, this allows your life to be lived according, well, without really any kind of constraint, without 
a God-ordained code of conduct or any moral framework given to you. We call them irreligious today, but they're still religious because they intuitively know that if they got too near to God, if they found or if they really dealt with God as he's revealed himself in the scriptures and as he delivers himself to you in the divine service, well, that would be uncomfortable. So instead, he's going to reveal, if you, if you allow him, reveal hidden faults. He would convict of wrongdoing. He would accuse of moral shortcomings and failures. But let's not have that. But of course, God is not going to allow this to be, not forever. He won't allow you to be who you want to be, but he's going to shake up heaven and earth obtrusively getting into your life. You can say the mantra of this age all you want, and it won't make any difference. It's my life, it's my body, it's my choice, it's my desires, and nothing you, God, are going to say is going to change that. But it doesn't stop people from trying. On the other hand, if you're not one of these licentious, liberal, progressive sort, who think that they can live a life apart from God, and do whatever the hell they want, because that's where it leads, after all, hell. It's possible, actually, to keep God at a distance and still be very religious. Now, that's the preferred approach for conservative Christians. We can acknowledge and confess God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, give a nod and wink to the revelation of Holy Scriptures, and even to... Jesus' own institutions of preaching and teaching, absolution, baptism and the supper, those are all good and appropriate at times. Put God's word into a box, limit it, limit to maybe just an hour each week, not really applying it to our day-to-day life and our vocations in this world. Forgiveness, that really only belongs in the church. Forgiveness doesn't belong in marriage or in the workplace or in the classroom or especially in civil society. That's the approach of conservative Christians. We fence Jesus off from most of our lives so that we're free, not really, to fill in whatever religious ideas and practices work best. So just like those Epicureans and Stoics, We can live a very religious life with faith in Christ and alongside the same time live completely contrary to what he has said. Devise a religious scheme for our own choosing to govern our day-to-day life. Now, you might not think I'm telling the truth on this, but think about it. Maybe you're religiously devoted to your family, willing to do anything to make them happy and content. But what happens when the religious service that Christ has set up, the divine service, gets in the way of your religious service to your family? But for others, they're workaholics. They're religiously devoted to work, spending every waking moment thinking about how to get the next break, to capture the big fish, to get the crops in on time. What are you going to do when a perfect opportunity arrives right in your lap on Sunday morning? See the conflict? And maybe you're religiously devoted to the pleasures of this world. I just can't give that up. I enjoy what I enjoy, Pastor. But what happens when Jesus speaks clearly and directly against those pleasures? We've got competing religions. They can't run side by side. You can be completely religious and still not have what it takes to live in Christ, now and especially eternally. What's really the problem here is religiosity. That's not what's actually needed. Zeal and dedication and commitment, living according to a code of conduct, those are all good, but that's not really what this is all about today. If if that were true, then... Those Stoics and Epicureans, they'd be right alongside us, walking through the gates of heaven. 
they lived a moral and upstanding life, committed to their cause, to their faith. If that were also true, then the most religious and devout people in the world would be saved, especially because they're so persistent and dedicated. And those we met in today's gospel, the Pharisees and the scribes. See, like Paul with those philosophers in Athens at the Areopagus, Jesus, too, faced the most committed and zealous religious people in Israel. Yes, they, too, were very religious. Maybe a different religion, but still, very religious. And it would seem to us, actually, in all the right ways, because unlike those philosophers that we met this week in our congregation of prayer, these scribes and Pharisees, they have what we call the Old Testament. They followed the law, the Torah, and the prophets. They knew the Psalms. They prayed them daily. They read their scriptures and religiously followed their prescriptions. They'd be considered by us the most conservative, devoted people, maybe something like the Amish or the Hasidic Jew, whose righteousness, their right way of living, let's be honest, would run circles around yours. But here's the problem. They're just like those philosophers. They keep God at a distance. Yes, they have received and taken God's word of law, but again, they've done the same. They've boxed it in, framed it, focused it, restated it, so that it could be doable and keepable, practical. So they would be righteous in themselves. So they think, as you've heard, I'm sure many times, that doing the law is what saves you. Disregarding God's promises to be saved by him. The promise made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and the rest. It's true that these very religious people have a use for God. But only so far as his word supports what they want to believe, what they want to think, and what they want to do. We have a contemporary practical example. They're like the supposed devout politician who claims that he trusts in Christ Jesus, but at the same time supports with rhetoric, policy, and finances the slaughter of innocent children in the womb. You cannot be a Christian and in any way support such a practice. Fifth commandment, after all. But think about it. The politician there has put God in his box. Religion is a private application. It doesn't apply to public life. And so, yes, I'll nod my head at the fifth commandment, but it really doesn't apply to a civil society. Remember the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. So there, again, the Torah is only as useful as far as we want it to be. What's really mistaken by either the philosophy of the Stoics and Epicureans or the religiosity of those scribes and Pharisees is what God is about with his word, what he is accomplishing. He's accomplishing with this word of law a wholesale, complete transformation of you and all who will listen. He says, for I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the most religious scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus isn't content with hypocrites, half-baked Christians. He's not content even with the most religious, the most observant among you. His word isn't given as a guide for your religion that will make you happy or maybe what you think you need to do to make God happy with you. He describes his word as a devastating fire, a whirlwind, something that purges the old leaven, that separates out the dross from the silver, that kills, kills the old Adam. That's what his word's supposed to do, not make you more religious, 
Because when his law is done with you, there will be nothing left but dust and ashes. He'll leave you with nothing to say, but who is going to save me from this body of death? So Jesus, by his word of law, takes all your self-appointed religion and distortions of that word. He takes them all into his body. He suffers them, and he dies for it all on his cross. Rather than you find religion that suits your heart, Jesus finds you and gives you his heart. He reveals to you the known God, Not just the God who devastates you with his word of law, but he reveals himself to you as the God who loves you. Loves you so much that he'll suffer the just penalty for your sin and die. And then open up himself to you, fulfilling all of his promises. That's the right understanding of God's word of law. And that's what the Father has been using the law and the prophets for from the very beginning, shaking heaven and earth, sifting out the wheat from the tares to bring you and all his elect to faith in Christ Jesus. He gives to you, then, life and gives to you to move and to have your being, but it's not in yourself. It's not in your religious observance. It's in Christ Jesus who was given to you comes to you most especially to forgive you of your most and very religious observance. And that's what's going on here today. Giving you that faith that trusts in him. As here, he serves you, not the other way around. This is the divine service, God's service. Where he gives himself to you, he speaks to you, he enlightens you, he makes you holy. He forgives you, and thereby you have salvation. This faith that he gives doesn't shy away from what God has to say, not a word of it, not a jot, not a tittle. It lets God's word have its way with you, day by day, sometimes making you uncomfortable, always accusing you, the law, but always forgiving you in Jesus Christ. This faith does not seek your own righteousness, not by your thinking, doing, philosophizing, or observing, but instead grants you to trust in the righteousness that you have in Christ and in the forgiveness of sins in him. And so this faith doesn't need to join sides or play team sport like the philosophers, Stoics versus Epicureans, or scribes versus Pharisees. Instead, all are gathered together in one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and fed together with Christ's one body and blood. And here's the kicker. God in Christ, having given you all this, means that you have all righteousness, all of his righteousness, a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees because it's Christ's righteousness given to you daily in the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. We stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our strength, our refuge, and our rock, do not be deaf to your people, but hear us as we lift up our hands in prayers toward your most holy sanctuary in heaven through the mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. God of all concord, by the death of your Son, you reconciled the world to yourself and made peace between God and man. Give us your spirit of peace and reconciliation, that your people may live together in forgiveness and harmony. Lord, in your mercy. 
O Lord, you gave the law that we might know your will and live as your holy people. Increase in us true fear, love, and trust in your saving word and your holy name, that we may have no other gods but you. Guide and bless all fathers and mothers, pastors and teachers, as they bring up children in the discipline and knowledge of this true faith. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you gave the commandments that we might live a holy life and love our neighbors as ourselves. Give us your Holy Spirit and teach us to honor authority, protect life, cherish marriage, respect possessions, defend reputations, and be content with the gifts you give us. Guide and bless all fathers and mothers, pastors and teachers, as they bring up children in wisdom and in favor with God and man. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, giver of all that is good, grant your healing and support to all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially pray for Tristan, Marcella, Jeremy, Kelsey, Amanda, John, Timothy, and Janice, Sandy, Ken, and Kaylee. Give them also the gift of your grace to accept and bear their crosses with faith in you, that finally they would be prepared to depart this life and receive the gift of eternal life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of every good gift, and we thank you that you have blessed the lives of those who celebrate birthdays this week with another year, especially Merlin and Don. James, Jesse, Sandra, Doug, James, Thomas, Summer, and Cora. Rejoice in the gift of baptism. Those who remember their baptism this week, Linda and Jared, Kira and Jean. We give you thanks for the upcoming wedding of Tyler and Elizabeth and for the gift of a pastor to Sheboygan Falls. We ask you to bless the work of all the missionary agencies of the Synod and the Church at large, especially this month, Compassion International. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood, you forgive our sins and bind us together in your communion of love. Grant that we may also gladly forgive the sins of our brothers and let no division arise among us who are gathered at the table. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in holy baptism, you join your children to the death and resurrection of your Son. Bless the memory of all your loved ones who have departed in the faith, especially brother of Jim, Roy, and comfort all who mourn with the knowledge that being united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to greet one another with the peace of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all th- places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and on all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord, Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
by righteousness, O Christ, alone can cover me. No righteousness avails, save that which is of thee. To whom save thee, who canst alone, or 